Thank you, uh, Nick and Kodal, for the invitation. Uh, now that I know there were dozens of people beating down the door, I, uh, I feel the pressure really intensely. But it's, um, it's so important to take the time to celebrate uh, people who have made such incredible um, scholarly contributions, but also broader contributions to the um, to, to the environments in which we work, and I think um, uh, I think of we've, we've already begun to hear about Alan's uh, uh, amazing scholarship. But um, as uh, somebody who's also been pulled into a, a kind of network of relationships that uh, Alan has built, not to mention uh, hospitality and a bit of singing and dancing <laughs> at um, at Francesca and uh, Alan's house, I think. Uh, it's just a wonderful chance to, um, to, to acknowledge that. So um, Alan really isn't in my cohort. He's more of my sort of elder brother in the Chicago uh, milieu. We did share, uh, as I realize also with Tony, a supervisor, Michael Silverstein, um, although there is no way I ever danced in a dingy bar with Michael. <laughs> and Alan's been a real mentor to me, especially the 13 years that I've been in Australia. So, um, as we all know, Australia lacks that dense interconnection of socio-cultural and linguistic anthropology that is part of the heritage of the Boazian synthesis of American anthropology. Um, and so it's been great to, um, to sort of be kept in that tradition in a certain way here in Australia via all the connections with, with Alan, and um, it was a, an invitation from Alan and Rupert Stash, a fellow Chicagoan, to participate in a, an edited journal on the linguistic anthropology of interlingual, um, interlingual articulations in Asia and the Pacific that got me to look at something I paid attention to but never actually written up, um, and that was this quite remarkable uh, vernacular language social movement in Renaldo where I worked for many times and that's kind of grown to be the focus of my research now and so Alan has kind of been a sounding board and a mentor that's that's pushed me um, in, in really productive uh, productive ways and he also invited me to come spend a semester here at CHL a couple of years ago that was an incredible sort of moment of um, intellectual engagement that we all kind of need to get away from our various troubles in our own universities. So many of the things, um, of the, among the many things that I think are really inspiring about Alan's scholarship is that breadth um, and the perspective that that breadth affords him on really basic questions about human cognition and personhood and intersubjectivity. So in preparing to say some words here, I read the half of, or some of the half of the corpus of Alan's work that as an anthropologist, I uh, only kind of glanced through. And it made me really think about the, the, the nature of his interdisciplinary research. And in a certain way, some interdisciplinarity is kind of sitting on the borders and the overlaps. But Alan, it's like a pair that we've been talking about. It is firmly in linguistics, and I know that because a lot of it is above my head, um, or beyond, beyond my kind of not technical knowledge, so really embedded in the, the, the uh, discussions that are really at the core of the disciplines of, li uh, of linguistics. Um, and then similarly, the anthropological work is very much anthropology, and not necessarily even the sub-discipline of linguistic anthropology. So it seems to me it's really deeply disciplined work, and he's moving kind of back and forth and, and bringing those insights across. And I love Tony's um, talk at the beginning, as I said in the, in the comments, and a certain sort of seeing across those themes, and it let me see in a way that um, summarized some of the work I was less familiar with, how this kind of certain approach to um, social cohesion kind of runs back and forth across, across those things. So we all know that Alan has contributed to, uh, as Nick laid out in the beginning, so many issues. Um, 
grammar, territoriality, oratory, poetry, myth, personhood, intersubjectivity, empathy, ethics, multilingualism, language policy, language socialization, sign languages, and so on. What I'm gonna focus on is kind of um, something that has influenced my own work, especially the art his work on the articulation of indigenous and uh, exogenous orders and the big questions of, of kind of how social change happens in, um, in real time practice uh, and interventions in anthropological theory over the last three decades. So I want to start with my own discovery of um, who water In the mid 90s, I, I started anthropology, I'd done a history degree. Um, and I moved from history to anthropology because of the frustration that I think every historian feels with the limitations of the archive, particularly if you're interested in people who are not speaking written languages, let alone writing down their, their own stories. Um, and I also, I suppose, entertained the somewhat naive hope of really getting to see change as it happened and not through a kind of retrospective lens, and also I like to talk to people. So I leapt into anthropology's deep end in the graduate program for anthropology at the University of Chicago, having never taken anthropology or social theory as an undergraduate. In fact, I don't think I knew who Durkheim or Saussure or pretty much anyone except Marx was. So there I am flailing around to grasp basic outlines of social theory in this deeply kind of theoretical department. And it seemed like a particularly stormy moment in uh, the history of a never particularly placid discipline. So there's sort of two issues that I think looking back I found unsettling. First was what seemed like a disconnection of anthropological theory from empirical research, especially ethnographic research. So there was kind of emerging a certain trend that really is kind of Playing down the data, and American anthropologists at, at that point, where there's often you sort of get this grand theory and then an anecdotal ethnographic chunk, and then you know you come back to Foucault or Derrida or Bourdieu or whatever it is. So it kind of like theory is generated somewhere else, and it's you take the ethnography to kind of illustrate <coughs> that, and that is the sort of thing we value, which I was not that interested in. Um, but also not sure how to make sense of it. And also a real problematization of the very project of seeing the world from another's point of view. Another's point of view and another point of view. And that's partly the kind of internal crisis of representation within anthropology, of how you know we're not writing the truth and how do we reflect on our own positionality in this kind of thing. And then I think more significantly, the broader challenge of decolonization globally and politically and trying to grapple with that. But I was really interested in understanding the world from other points of view. That was kind of what drove me in. So I'm flailing around and um, I moved into the sphere of the um, linguistic anthropology of the Michael Silverstein genre with its focus on sort of indexic, indexicality and uh, language ideology as really clear ways in which um, language, something you can actually see, you can record it, you can analyze it in this nice, very um, empirical way to connect to really much bigger ideas about social structure and cosmological structure. So that really kind of pulled me in as a sort of very rigorous and thoughtful approach to the broader questions of meaning that seem to be causing all sorts of conundrums in anthropology. And I distinctly remember the moment when I found the book that was my life raft, my sort of beacon uh, in the stormy seas of anthropological theory, and that was Kuwaru Language and Segmentary Politics in the Nebulier Valley. Dude, I remember my friend Alex Golub, who did say dude because he's Californian and he was young at that time. We're reading this in our Pacific Island uh, reading group with folks like Rupert Stash and um, Ira Bashkow and, and others. Alex said, dude, this is a book for people who are really interested in language and really interested in Papua New Guinea. 
Um, and all of us were, so we absolutely loved it. I remember reading it for days in the library, like reading in that way you only read when you're a graduate student and going, I really need to understand this, I don't understand. And I took pages and pages of notes, which I still have and I was rereading. Each chapter I tried to, tried to summarize it all. And so why this really grabbed me, other than its level of kind of rigor, was that it showed how you could have a intricately detailed, linguistically focused ethnography, a kind of watching what people are doing on the ground, how you could turn that into and, and, and um, build out of it a sophisticated theoretical analysis of structural transformation, which was what I was interested in coming into it from, uh, from history. So at the time I read Kuwaru, I'd already was well versed in Marshall Solon's notion of structural transformation, the way you have cultural, cultural structures and then in, in events they are transformed in, 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 in various circumstances as they're mobilized in action. But it was that he was kind of focusing on things that happened 200 years ago in, in which retrospectively the actors looked very, very kind of, kind of clear. Um, how do you understand historical change as it's happening in the messiness of everyday life? How do you even see what the groupings and the identities and the roles are? And that was what I found so powerful in, in Kuro Waru. So it's focused on understanding how events and actors, this is how I, what I drew from this in really important work, are constructed in social action, particularly speech as social, social act and action. Alan and Francesca suggest that whether a collective or individuals, these, these groupings, quote, cannot be taken for granted as empirically an existing unit. They are hard won social constructions, which if they are to exist at all, must exist at least in part as more or less contested representations. So that's of course a theme that was running around a lot of anthropology at the time, kind of really most powerfully perhaps Marilyn Strathern's Gender of the Gift. But a lot of that discussion of the kind of inchoiteness or the ways that persons are really constituted in action and through interaction had a sort of essentializing sense that this is what Melanesian persons do but other persons are maybe not like that. And often on a kind of really high level of generalization and a certain essentialism and, and abstraction. But with, with Kuwaru, you get all of that, but it's really this kind of empirical rigor. Seeing it in the ground first in their example of the, of the, dispute, um, the dis dispute discourse that Daria mentioned uh, between war and factions. And then, to me, this was the part that just, I thought, ah, this is where it is. In, in, the, in the context of a new collective, a women's group, that is sort of stepping into it discursively and socially and spatially, figuring itself to some degree as a segmentary lineage, but also not. And you could see how that's contested and could go either way. So you really see sort of structure and action and structure and transformation. Um, so in that and other work, you get a sense of the cultural specificity of Kuwaru notions of the person, of this wonderful parallelism in structure and in discourse. Um, in, in, in the sense of events not just happening, but people needing to grasp them and transform and, and grab the meaning of the event. So this is all culturally different. But that kind of methodology, and I think, again, this is what set it apart for me from a lot of the Melanesianist anthropology of the time, was that it was an approach to social life that was broadly generalizable. We are all constructed in interactions and, and importantly in action and speech. Speech everywhere has this metapragmatic function of saying this is a particular kind of event and I'm a particular kind of actor in that event and um, in approaching fieldwork in the Western Solomons and particularly the, the issue of community um, I found that really incredibly helpful. So community groups, clans are not just there, but they're also not a sort of a figment, a romantic figment of like uh, development discourse, imagination, we're doing community development. It's not just that. It is a project, you know, like the clans, like the lineage. So that was, pro that book really, it has influenced me and continues to influence me. A few, comments on, on Alan's uh, 
Hein brings this other discipline and thinks about the debates within anthropology. I want to make a few comments on an, another important paper, 2004, Ethnographic Macrotropes, um, in which um, Alan's talking about some of those debates that I sort of flailed into in the mid-90s and seems kind of bemused by the two binaries in, the, in, a, in a debate about the textuality of anthropological texts. On the one hand, um, there are those who, quote, felt that a sustained focus on ethnographic texts as text, so the question of what makes them persuasive or not persuasive, was seen to devalue their capacity for representing the way things are in the world and to deflect attention from what should be taken as prior and more important questions, namely the empirical adequacy of those representations and the theoretical propositions they were meant to bear as, on as evidence. And then on the other side, the textualist kind of said, oh, the text is not a realistic representation that it claims to be, so therefore we must kind of chuck it out and we're not interested in those truth claims. So Alan works through beautifully these absolutely kind of insightful readings of four <laughs> ethnographic texts, he argues and illustrates, far from being inimical, quote again, uh, far from being inimical to a serious inquiry of its theoretical claims, a focus on the textual features of ethnography is actually necessary in order to understand those claims because ethnography is inherently figurative. That is, it makes use of tropes, poetic figures, not just as ancillary aids to vivid description, but as essential constitutive features of the form of knowledge which it enables. And he also showed how some of the structures of the texts prefigured and did something else then what the actual kind of denotative word on the page was doing. So it's a wonderful paper in terms of going a neither nor kind of battle to a sort of both end. Yes, we need to look at these texts and that doesn't preclude them pointing to some kind of new perspective on an infinitely complex social world. So as I reread this paper now after a decade or so, I was also interested in a kind of symmetry in the way, and, and sorry to say, also reading it with thinking about issues of epistemological injustice and trying to decolonize scholarship. A lot of uh, indigenous scholars are um, rightly annoyed at anthropologists in particular and others um, more generally at the way that indigenous knowledge might be data but not theory, so the theory is always exogenous and the, the other stuff is the data. But in a way, that paper on ethnography, Alan is treating the ethnographic text in the very same way that he's treating Kuaru, Sung Tales, or any other kind of speech. And there's a kind of real um, symmetry, not symmetry or uh, respect given both to these classic ethnographic texts, it's not a debunking exercise, but it's the same kind of, I think, respect and engagement that um, is evident in the work with, um, with, with Kuwaru and all the other texts. Um, finally, I just want to point to one example from the recent paper on um, language, affect, and the inculcation of social norms in New Guinea, Highlands, and beyond. This wonderful child socialization work as the kind of really basic unit, not the mind-to-mind, sasur -mind kind of you know, the communication between minds, but the child on the lap directing attention to something in the world and seeing how we, we kind of intersubjectively perceive it. There's a conversation that Alan um, recounts the mother, the toddlers on the toddlers on the lap, and there's a or to toddlers engaging, and there's a third child that is the object of address and attention. And the mother basically says, um, "Brother," the bro mother tells the child to say, to the toddler to say, "Brother, stop crying." Child repeats it. Brother, stop crying. Let's go to Kalinge. Child repeats it. Let's go get, eat cheese pops, a salty snack. Um, and then the mother says, let's go. And the kid says to his, the baby says to his brother, you're a big head. <laughs> I thought, hope I've accounted this, this appropriately. Now there's pages that he squeezes in terms of what is going on beyond the denotation of those words. 
Um, but what I want to draw out is the way in which um, the, the, there's a parallelism between crying and home and the indigenous language and then the, the child, sort of, by saying you're a big head to the brother, is kind of stepping into this outsider role, criticizing the big-headed nature of, of um, Kuwaram speakers by kind of embodying a pigeon in a more cosmopolitan perspective. So saying, and that, so on the one hand, there's the crying, the home, and um, and the, the this this big-headedness, this improper comportment, not controlling oneself. And on the other side, there's the allure of cheese pops and kalinge and not crying and also two brothers acting together as two brothers really ought to do. So this kind of, this kind of um, parallel, this kind of um, set of oppositions, you don't get a cosmology from a cheese pop. And yet in that tiny little interaction, I see sort of the ways in which in such a deeply intimate and embedded ways so many of the things that all of us ethnographers working in that region grapple with about how people feel that their own places are not worth that much, that everything worth doing is somewhere else. Um, you know, issues of language change and turning to pigeon, uh, issues of wanting to leave home to become anything. And, and one sees it's not in those macro structures, but in the intimacy of this um, mother-child inter inter interaction. So that is something I just, find um, really Im impressive, aside from the amazing, rich, longitudinal data that we get from that project. So to wrap up, we've already heard a little bit about um, Alan's wonderful 2013 paper on interdisciplinarity and the intersection of um, anthropology, anthropological, uh, linguistic anthropology, and um, linguistics. Um, so. What I learned from that was about precisely this kind of very distinctive A and U tradition, in which it seemed to me the, there, there's not in anthropology in the in in Australia a particular interest in language in the way that is so integral to the American tradition, but there has been an interest in working with peoples of Papua New Guinea and in Australia, in which there's amazingly diverse languages and linguists are in, in really important just to. To, to, to even speak to and understand these, these, these folks. And at the end of that paper, Alan suggests that there's a kind of potential with a new interest in documentary linguistics for new kinds of um, intersections and, and overlaps and collaborations between anthropologists and, um, and uh, linguists. But on the anthropology side, one of the things that has happened over the last, well now, 30 years is a real turning away from those sorts of, of field sites. So when I started University of Chicago in the mid-1990s, almost everybody did you know, proper field work, and we're told to go do proper field work before you do field work in the US. By the time I left, not only nine years later, I did not do the joint degree, which would have been 15. It was only nine, so I was speedy. Um, uh, not quite 15, but um, it had actually reversed. And everybody in my sort of cohort who's become a kind of anthro superstar are folks who, for one reason or another, did more metropolitan field work and not the more marginal, more remote places. And Alan wrote in a paper nearly 15 years ago that there's been a change of fashion in anthropology over the 20, past 20 years or so, whereby field projects carried out in such remote locales as rural Papua New Guinea have become to be regarded as anti-Diluvian, embarrassing reminders of anthropology's original identification with the, quote, savage slot among the social science disciplines. In truth, this reversal has had the unfortunate consequence of tacitly affirming the very proposition that we as anthropologists should aim to combat, that there is such a place in the world as the savage slot, which we can and should avoid by directing our research elsewhere. So that turning away for all sorts of sort of theoretical fashion reasons, I think, is compounded by a total disinterest, um, especially in Australia, with um, getting students to learn any foreign languages. So I have had, we have at the University of Melbourne, a number of students doing research in Papua New Guinea, but in a three-year degree, 
with no prior language training, none of that is happening in small languages and in vernacular languages. It's all in um, pidgin, in English, and, and that kind of thing. So I guess I wonder, and maybe this is a good place to open for discussion, what is the kind of future interface of anthropology and linguistics, ones that Alan has occupied and moved back and forth between in such incredibly rich and fruitful ways. In anthropology, can we imagine uh, you know, a more thorough, overcoming the steep inequalities of education that might draw speakers of small languages into a discipline that has been more others focused? Can we imagine as non-indigenous, non, you know, more metropolitan people engaging in ways that are truly collaborative with, um, with speakers of small languages and working with linguists in that? And can we kind of take that intersection that's been here at least really focused on the small languages of the region um, more broadly to think about language in all aspects of, of um, languages, a form of social action in all aspects of life. And can there be collaborations there? Thank you. For uh, discussion, but before we go into that, I just want to uh, take the, uh, one moment to thank two people I've been thanked before, without whom this event would not have run, and that is Romina and Joe from our COTAL administration, who've been steadily working behind the scenes over the last months to make sure that this all ran in the way that it has. So thank, thanks to you both, and please join. <laughs> So now, I guess we turn to the, you know, the big, either the cheese pop question or the where do we get our next Alan from? Yes, Austin that's or right. Whatever else is <laughs> there, a few minutes for question time. Well, if Alan, I'll jump in and say uh, one thing that uh, you didn't really stress in that like, 2013 paper point I tried to make is that. Although there hasn't been a tradition of linguistic anthropology from within anthropology in Australia, yeah. there is much more openness to anthropology in many more departments of linguistics in Australia than there is in the US. And that's why I felt more comfortable here for all of my academic life. And the pinnacle of that is the center of excellence in the yes. dynamics, where I have met my match in terms of interdisciplinary so Yes, really yes. <laughs> no, I, um, I, 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 that's an important point in that, in that paper and one that I hadn't quite got my head around before reading it. So. But I know, for instance, like I've been having a lot to do since going to the University of Melbourne with Nick Tiberger and a lot of stuff has come out of that, um, including next week. Um, but, but Nick sort of said, oh, you know, I've, we've, I've never had conversations with the anthropologists at University of Melbourne because and, and and none are sort of interested none are I mean it's it's all different configurations and that's true anywhere but I feel like I'm I'm the sort of exception yeah. in having had the time to immerse myself in a community learn a small language and be you know yeah. and, and and have the the, the, the sort of interest in, in these things I'm, I'm not the norm in the way that maybe yeah. Years ago, it might have been. Uh, I mean, I would pick up Alan's point and say that yes, there is that nice feature of the sort of linguistic tradition in Australia, but the actual level of training that we're able to give in, in terms of how much anthropology does a typical linguistics student take, it, it's very, very small mm -hmm. anywhere. And even if there there is some unit somewhere for you know language and culture or, yeah. or something, it doesn't go very far. It's not very rigorous. Uh, so mm -hmm. you know, I think it's a problem on both sides. And I think the whole resurgence of documentary linguistics, which is a great thing in many ways, but uh, it's also anthropologically incredibly naive. Yeah, you guys thing. were talking about that. If 
not, I mean, Amina, you were cut off before uh, asking a question to Daria. Do you want to just do that now? Because I also felt that yes, it is they, they are different than than the real fights. That is why I'm thinking that yes, we can think of it as a separate linguistic register because there are some features, but I haven't analyzed it uh, properly yet. So, so it does it. physical violence ever occur, for example, in those ones you were discussing? No, not in no. The, not not as many as I've witnessed. Yeah. Not in these cases. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. So look, what I'd like to do is take a shorter afternoon break because there's a, a little space at the end of the afternoon you may have noticed that I want to enlarge somewhat uh, for various reasons that I'll announce when we resume. Uh, but if we could start back, is, are people okay if we start back at 10 past three? Okay. What's the time so now? that gives quarter of an hour uh, for coffee. Yeah, all right. So please uh, join me in, in thanking uh, Yeah, 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 yeah.